Welcome to the Genealogy Happy Hour, a place where new family historians can learn to document their family histories and celebrate their new discoveries. I'm Amy. And I'm Penny. And we're here to help you discover your family tree from the beginning. Welcome to episode 90. Today we're going to talk about church records. Great resource of finding lots of different things in the churches and how you can find them, how you can find the churches, all that great stuff. But before we dive into that, do we have a wine, Amy? We do have a wine, one that I just found. I was browsing at Total Wine the other day and I came across, um, I was looking for Austrian wines because I've kind of got on an Austrian wine kick since this summer. And I found one called Orange, that's the label. Just it's an orange label and it says orange on it. And it's a Gruner uh, Vetliner and it has a rating of uh, James Stuckling rating of 90. And it is a dry white, um, green apple and herbs, medium body, which is what I like. And um, but it has this really cool kind of orange, almost a deep straw color to it. It's very different. It's a very different color, which is kind of weird, but it tastes really good. It's got a moderately dry finish, and I love it. So I thought I would show that. That sounds really interesting. And and really, all I got out of that whole thing is you browsing in Total Wine. I feel like. <clears throat> They know you there, and they're like, oh, Amy's back. <laughs> it was browsing. Sorry. It was browsing as opposed to putting my order in online and just picking it up. <laughs> Having them bring it out to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Or you no. wouldn't have found this one if you weren't in the store, Exactly right? right. That's why I, you know, you have to go in every once in a while and take a look and see what's, on, you know, on the shelves. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. The sponsor of today's episode of Genealogy Happy Hour is Newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Newspapers.com is your ultimate resource for discovering your family's history. Explore more than 800 million newspaper pages in their vast collection spanning three centuries. Newspapers.com is your gateway to exploring the past with papers from the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, and beyond. Trace your family's journey and uncover the extraordinary tales of your ancestors through newspaper stories, birth and marriage announcements, obituaries, photos, and much more. For listeners of today's show, Newspapers.com is extending a discount of 20% off on a Publisher Extra subscription. Just use the code HAPPYHOUR at checkout. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity. Church records are often a valuable resource in providing evidence of birth, death, and marriages. They can also give you insights into how our ancestors acted or were perceived in a religious community. Penny, you have an interesting (coughs) family story about how your ancestor was perceived in the religious community, don't you? This is a great one to start off with. Yes, when we were in Connecticut on our research trip, Uh um, we found uh, a record, or I found a record for one of my ancestors back in 1773 on May 2nd. Uh Josiah Talmadge and his wife made a confession in their church to their pastor of, of fornication. Now, (laughs) this page that this Mm -hmm. was listed on had also 13 other confessions of fornication. It was Mm -hmm. all, it must have been the fornication page, I guess. Um, But those covered like three years, so it didn't seem to happen that often, I guess. (laughs) 13 in three years. But I'm so interested because they were mostly, you know, this person and his wife, so... Was it a certain day they weren't allowed to do that? What I really want to know the the circumstances. So they were just um, pa- they just chose the wrong day to be passionate. I guess. I guess maybe it was a Sunday. I don't know. But it proves that my ancestor was a member of that church and they were living in New Haven, Connecticut at that time. So well, and you also have proof there that they're husband and wife because it it referred to her as the spouses married. Yeah. So there you go. 
All right. Well, often these church records are the only direct evidence of vital events prior to the state government records, which usually only standardized in the United States in the early 1920s. <clears throat> so, um, analyzing these records, <clears throat> obviously, you're not going to have a birth record, but you're most likely going to have a baptism record, a marriage record, a burial record, a cemetery record, mem membership lists, um, and, you know, the naughty list, I guess, <laughs> which the, the, your yeah, ancestor the list, list yeah. the fornication list. Oh, well, now, here's, here's another one. You know, those are all things that a lot of the church records will have. But if you're going way back, mm. I was looking for an ancestor um, in Pennsylvania, and they attended, uh, I had their marriage record from the Dutch Reformed Church. And I went through um, the rest of, there was like over 3,000 pages in this record, and it was on ancestry. And I'm, I'm sure not all of it was, uh, like nice. they had gone through and put everybody's name in there for every page. <clears throat> lot of minutes, a lot of church uh, donations, whatever. But I did happen to find them, again, listed in um, the section for a pew rental. So, All right. So they like, had some, they another had... proof that, yes, they were still in this church. Not only did they get married there, but now they were there many years after. Mm -hmm. um, right, <clears throat> right. Renting a pew. right. So that's also proof that they were still living in the community that they had not died yet. So, correct. Uh, correct. But, so these these need to be these records. The church records need to be carefully analyzed, and we really have to call every piece of information that we can out of these records. For example, baptism. Um, obviously, it's going to have the names of the parents and the date of the the name of the child and the date of the birth and the date of the baptism, but the sponsors and the witness names are very important because those could often be relatives. Was the birth legitimate? Um, the occupations of the parents are often listed. Family's residence, you know, did they travel from another town to come here? Um, were they local? And um, sometimes you will also see a cross drawn on the baptism record and that usually indicates that, that the child died at some point. Um, while the family was still a member of the congregation. From yeah, I have um, uh, the, um, the same family I was working on in the Dutch Reformed Church. I just saw something interesting. I don't know if this is a thing or not, but looking around um, that pew rental area, other people that were renting pews had the last name of Chapman. And there are oldest son's middle name is Chapman. And I thought, um, oh, right. I mean, could these people have been like really good friends mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. that they, you know, held in high esteem that used their name for their child? I thought that was really interesting. Right. Is there, is there a connection to the Chapman family somewhere? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly right. That's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so look, again, with that fan club or like, even when we do in the census, look a page up and a page back to right. see who's living near. Who's looking. Look who's sitting near them in church, if you can find those pew rentals. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, for the marriages, you know, obviously we're looking for the information on the bride and groom and the date of the marriage, but also were they single? Were they widowed? <clears throat> what are their ages at, at marriage? Where did they come from? Where did they reside? Their occupations, or the, at least the man's occupation, will probably be listed. Um, possibly their place of birth and their parents' names, and again, obviously witnesses to the marriage, <clears throat> who are um, who are witnessing. Like you said, you know that it's a fan club. Um, burials and cemetery records, the residence at death, the cause of death, um, spouse or parents. You know, you're really fortunate if you get both the parents, but maybe sometimes at least the father is listed in the age um, where they were where they were born. Sometimes it's also recorded in the burial um, cemetery plot. Again, like you said, we're looking for the fan club, right? Not only for your ancestor, but who who else is buried in that plot, possibly? Mm -hmm. Or in the plots next to them, or whatnot. Right. Yep. The date that they died, the date they were buried, their age, and again, like the family. So. 
Um, and then like we talked about, you know, membership um, date that they joined the congregation. That's a good um, indication of when, when they came to the community, when they moved to that community. So that could be a, a starting point for you to start looking for civil records um, in the community or um, within a county history. You know, does it say anything about when that they when they came or mm-hmm. when you can stop? Oh, and also, if you've got an ancestor like mine in this Dutch reform, I know they left Pennsylvania at one point and moved to Ohio. So I knew they were Dutch reform there. So it makes it easy to try to find a church in the area that they landed in Ohio to see if there was also a Dutch Reformed church there that they may have joined. So you could do that with any of your ancestors. If they're Baptist, you know, whatever their affiliation was to look as they move on. Right. Good point. Um, on the membership list, you could also find information about, about their admission, you know, maybe where, where they came from, um, the, con- the last congregation that they were a member of. And then on the membership list, it might also list a date of death. Um, that might be the only uh, record that you have of your ancestors, um, you know, passing is on that membership list if they were a member when they, um, when they died. Um, another thing to look for, you know, again, <clears throat> looking at the broader, a broader research is the congregation itself. Like you said, you know, you knew that your family were Dutch Reformed when they moved there, you know, looking for histories of the churches um, that in those communities that they might have been a member of to see if your ancestors mentioned, um, you know, serving either in a pastoral position or in a lay capacity within the church. And like you said, which do you know, what you fig- figuring out which denominate re- religion or denomination your um, ancestor, uh, you know, was drawn to or was a member of is sometimes the most um, challenging part <laughs> of the whole process. You know, sometimes it, it looks at you can look at their let's uh, let I'm just taking this couple that was the Dutch reform couple. <clears throat> the hills and they moved from pennsylvania to ohio and now if i couldn't find the church that they were into my i would look at maybe where their children got married in ohio like what could i find out what church they got married in and would that have been the church that they ended up at or the church that um the new spouse is at or you know at least get the area um just looking at where those marriage records are after, and I'm, I'm also going with after they move. Now, if they're in one area and they stay there forever, that's a different situation. But if they're right, if their marriage record, if you find even a civil marriage record, you know, a marriage return that was filed with the county, it's usually going to say who married this couple. And then you can try and find information about that individual, usually a man who married them. And then, you know, what pat you know what denomination was he in his religious mm-hmm. in the religious capacity you know what and then that will give you an indication of maybe what church that they were a member of yeah. by looking up the person who married them unless it's a justice of the peace but if it says minister of the gospel or something like that then you can yeah. try and trace that individual to find out what what church that they were going to so um also using obituaries. Sometimes, the, you know, if there's an obituary, the funeral service was performed from a certain church or the social mm-hmm. columns uh, back in the day. You know, they had those, you know, the church picnic or some sort of social inf- inf- social statement in the newspaper could give you an indication of what um, where they were a member of. And then some churches kept better records than others. You know, Penny, like you said, you know, the Reformed Church, you got a lot of information from the Reformed Church about um, what was going on in each of their individual churches. Um, Catholics, Lutherans, uh, Quakers, or Society of Friends, um, the um, Latter-day Saints, the Presbyterians, and the Anglicans are all usually really good record keepers about their membership. Uh, They also have baptisms they have more um liturgical processes you do have to be careful though because sometimes catholics and lutherans tend to want to write in latin and so their records could actually be written in latin rather than in 
in English, or if they remember. Yeah, or German. Correct. German yes. for Lutherans, for sure. That's what I was about ready and to I say. And I know, um, my gra- I know, I think I've mentioned this on a way long ago early oh. podcast, when my grandparents got married, I had to pick between two churches in their little town that they went to to try to determine which one they got married at and um, had to call both of the churches. Mm -hmm. Finally did um, have one church find a record for me. They did not get married at a church. They got married at a house in town, but by the pastor of the church. And going further back into the records, that church was being renovated at the time. So the, the church, so, so the church had the record? wasn't even, hmm The church had the record, but I had to call them and and find out. Well, I, had, I called both churches and asked for records, and the one came back and said, we don't have anybody mm-hmm. with that, and the other one um, had the records. So that was interesting. That is interesting, but they have But the- then I'm like, whose house was this? You know, somebody's <laughs> house in town. Like, wow, they <laughs> Did they rent it out? Were they friends? You know, again, right? There's, there's a there's a fan club there. So you, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Was it mm-hmm. a a distant relative or interesting? Right. And if you can find the church, you know, and hopefully they have records that go back that far. Have a historian or an archivist that um, can look that up for you. It's always nice to give them a little donation as well. With you know, they're doing Absolutely. this extra work for you. Absolutely. Now, if you're if your um, relatives, if you know, especially down, you know, here in the South, um, many um, of our ancestors were members of, like, say, a Baptist church or um, churches that were independently managed, not necessarily a part of a um, a national organization. And so, record keeping was very much at the not only the congregational level, but sometimes also at the pastor level. So the pastor would take his, the records, you know, everyone that he either baptized or the funerals he did, he would take those records with him when he went to the next parish. And so sometimes you're going to have to track down the pastor and what happened to his records. So, and I believe the same thing is is true with rabbis in a synagogue that they take their records with them when they they move on so maybe and that could be a case of looking at your um local county Mm -hmm. historical society or Mm -hmm. um uh you know just to see if somebody has donated the books from those pastors or doctors too you know exactly right i mean i found most of the church records like you were talking about in pennsylvania uh, my ancestors who were from pennsylvania uh, at the county archives because mm-hmm. the, ch- the churches, mm-hmm. uh, and even the church, you know, when we went on our Connecticut, New Jersey um, road trip, research trip, I was looking for church records from this one particular church in New Jersey. Uh, the church is still there. I wrote to them, and they said, no, all of our records have been transferred to the local library. And so I had to go. So sometimes you have to start tra- tracking these these records down to find out exactly where they went. But... State college, state, uh, excuse me, colleges and universities, uh, you'd be amazed at how much uh, is donated to, um, again, to colleges and universities. And it may not even be where that church was, but like you said, where the pastor ended up being or the university or college that the pastor went to, he may donate, have donated his records back to that that college which could be four states over you know you've got to really which is why um archive grid um or um world cat really comes into play when you can so you can start locating documents and uh, record sets um throughout um the united states yeah you really have to be a detective there to try to track these people down and find out maybe where they (laughs) And, and, you know, you could do all that work and find out they they didn't even, they left nothing, you know. Or your, or your ancestors. It's always worth a shot. Or your ancestors not even mentioned. <laughs> but. Right. 
Right. Like, let's go through 2,000 pages of this church record and find nothing. <laughs> that would have been a miserable. Right. Because most of the time. A couple of hours. Right. Most of the time, they're not going to be indexed, too. So, yeah, you've got to really roll up your sleeves mm-hmm. and, and get a long list of all the relatives that lived in that area so you can pull anything from anybody's name that you recognize. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, luckily, some of the records have been scanned. Some churches, um, church organizations have allowed um, the records to be scanned and family search has an extensive collection of church records from the United States, but not all are digitized. Um, however, I was just reading online. Um, I know that you can always go to a family, um, a family history center, a local family history center. If it's not something that's, that's available on um, on your computer at home sometimes it is digitized you just have to go to one of their family the local family history center um, but you can also request that a microfilm be digitized um, to family to family search um, from the family history library in salt lake city um, sometimes that might work as well that you can ask for that but the family his uh, family excuse me the family search wiki also has a very extensive how to find church records in the United States page with numerous links based on not only denomination, but also state. So that's definitely a resource that you should look at. So you touched on a little bit, I think back on, you know, trying to find the churches, because I think that's always my big thing. Mm -hmm is we get a lot of information of, oh, you can find all this stuff in your church records, and then half the people are saying, how do I find the church? I can't find the church. You know, and you mentioned a couple things that might be listed in the marriage records. You know, it might say who the pastor is, and you can kind of track it down that way. But if you don't have anything like that, um, one thing I've done is I have a, you have an ancestor, and you have their address from the census, of where they lived in that town. And you can look um, online and put that address in and see in on Google Maps or uh, Google Earth what churches are close by. What What is in the vicinity of your ancestor? Because depending on what year you're looking, it's not like they're gonna be driving their car 30 minutes to go to church. They're gonna be walking to church mm-hmm. or they got a horse and buggy or whatever. Right, right. And a lot of these churches that are listed in these small towns are still there. They're they're older churches. So you can kind of see and figure out, okay, there's a Methodist church here, there's a Presbyterian, there's a Baptist. These are all within a good distance of my ancestor. Let's see if those churches have anything online. So that's my next step is, you know, I go to each one of those churches. I look and see if there's any kind of online records. Um, And then if not, then the next thing you do is you call them. And I'm looking for your archives, your archivist. You keep records. If not, where are they? Like you just mentioned, where would they be? And you kind of have to do a lot of detective work. Agreed. Yes. It, it, it's, this is a lot of legwork to just to try and find the records. Absolutely. Um, I would highly recommend, I mean, we've talked about um, family tree webinars. I highly recommend family tree webinars. It's, I think it's about $49 to join for a, an annual subscription. And there's literally hundreds of webinars on there that are wonderful. Uh, and um, recently one, uh, it was recorded in in published in June of this year, and I just watched it maybe a month or so ago by a- Amy Larner Giroux called Finding Your One Among Millions Methods and Tips for Urban Research, a New York City stu- case study. And in it, she she's looking for anse- for church records for an ancestor who lived on, I think it was the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And she, in the 19th century, and she uses... Um, city maps from that time period locating the churches and she she does uh, it's very it's very interesting how she the methodology that she used to find the right church where her ancestors and where her where the family was all baptized so try and find the baptismal records that makes perfect sense using those older maps from the time period you know just to see what's there i'm just i was just using some current ones but yeah no she and and, right she used the old ones and then she also looked at the current ones because you also have to see okay well is this church still there you know and i think one of the churches had been demolished because um they had built a bridge 
Um, so then she had to figure out, okay, so then she had to figure out where the records from that church that was demolished, where did it go? Where did those parishioners go? And so I think she actually found them at one of the other churches that was still around. So really yeah, fascinating, okay. really fascinating. I would highly recommend um, all of the the webinars on there. But this one, again, it's, it's um, Amy Larner Giroux's Finding Your One Among Millions. And it was from June of uh, 2023. And I believe it's a... Um, board for certification of genealogists um i think it's one of, of their sponsored uh, webinars too so yeah highly okay. recommend it yeah sounds like a good one so um hopefully this gives you some ideas on where to look um the types where to look for your ancestors uh religious um records and then once you find those, really analyze them, and you're going to have to roll up your sleeves because sometimes they are not particularly indexed. So, But you can find a treasure trove of information, stuff that you wouldn't even think that you could find, including Penny's ancestors who were <laughs> amorous on the wrong day of the year. Yes. <laughs> yes. But they Always can- a story to tell. <laughs> But they did confess it, so. They confessed it. Yeah. That's a miracle. What, what on earth? Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Who needs to know? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> All right. Until next time. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening. Please email us with any questions or comments at genealogyhappyhour at gmail.com. Visit our website, www.genealogyhappyhour.com, for additional resources, books, and wines. Don't forget to drink responsibly. And never drink around genealogical documents.